I'm uh, Chris Frizzell. I'm the science guy with the Pacific Rivers Council, and uh, I'll be talking about a subject which um, I heard er earlier, uh, Vera Smith of the Wilderness Society, I had to smile, she commented. I thought we um, stopped talking about logging and repairing areas about 30 years ago. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was 20, I don't know, but <laughs> that's kind of uh, my sense. There's a little bit of deja vu here, but we're in, in a, this is a subject which has come back around again, and it's of interest on the Mount Hood National Forest and pretty much all the other units in the National Forest System and uh, other federal land management agencies. Again, it's not nearly as important in my estimation as the roads discussion that Mary um, just gave us. And uh, I'm going to uh, tr try your patience and probably skipping over a couple of slides here to try to make up time. The context for this whole discussion today uh, on federal lands in the Mount Hood National Forest and others is the, uh, the Northwest Forest Plan that we've heard a bit about. When the Northwest Forest Plan um, was crafted largely by a group of scientists locked in a building here in Portland for a couple of months um, called the Forest Ecosystem Management Assessment Team, one of the things that got left on the table uh, uh, as kind of an open question is what the role of active management of forests inside of the what became called riparian reserves under the Northwest Forest Plan would be in the future. There was not consensus on this question of how all of the forests that were contained in the fairly extensive riparian reserve system that came out of the Northwest Forest Plan should be managed, or whether they should be managed at all. Can nature take care of itself uh, through uh, natural processes, process of self-restoration and regrowth in riparian zones? It was recognized clearly riparian zones had been seriously harmed by past logging activities in them. And, um, and so the debate uh, left the question a little bit open in terms of how the rules were finalized when the Northwest Forest Plan came down. In fact, the plan, um, to cope with that uncertainty, the Northwest Forest Plan did establish a standard, a new burden of proof for actions occurring within riparian reserves, <coughs> timber harvest in particular, but many others as well. But just focusing on timber harvest today, uh, the, uh, the practice would have to be, uh, in, by the criteria established in the Northwest Forest Plan, necessary to attain aquatic conservation strategy ob objectives. And you can translate that into it, it would have to be a, a restorative action, a necessary restorative action. In other words, if we didn't cut some trees in the riparian zone, bad things would happen. The system's on a, a, a successional crash course with a bad state. And if we don't, because of past, past management, for example, or past uh, cutting of all the big trees in the riparian reserve, whatever it might be. So some intervention is necessary. Um, in fact, the, there was also some language identifying some of the kinds of practices that should be considered um, under this um, option. Uh, uh, practices might be necessary to control tree stocking, for example, in overstocked plantations. Um, that had been clear cut prior to the Northwest Forest Plan. There may be a need for fuels treatment even, even in, at this time in 93 was recognized that the, the, the possible need for fuels treatment and fire suppression activities in riparian reserve areas. Um, what we have seen in the last couple of years is, is kind of a, this whole issue breaking wide open and it really broke open in the Bureau of Land Management's Western Oregon Plan Revisions where um, the plan, the federal government, this agency proposed fairly dramatic um, reductions in the area that is actually contained within riparian reserves and also a fairly dramatic increase in, in the breadth of activities that are al allowed within riparian uh, reserves, which were no longer even called riparian reserves. This plan has uh, been um, stymied in court. so. Uh, after a few back and forths, but it does establish kind of a new standard that f at least uh, many decision makers in the federal agencies appear willing to live with. On the Forest Service si side, we've seen a series of uh, actually uh, several years now of battles with the National Marine Fisheries Service and consultations where the Forest Service has advocated programmatic authority, authority to uh, embark on logging programs within at least the outer margins of riparian reserves and the National Marine Fishery Service has been for various reasons that I'll highlight some of here been reluctant to go that far. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot more about species other than um, in-stream aquatic species but it should be recognized in any discussion about riparian reserves and how they're managed that uh, the way the Northwest Forest, the architecture of the Northwest Forest Plan uh, establishes riparian reserves as a very fundamental component of late successional habitat for 
those upland and terrestrial species as well as aquatic species that are dependent on late successional forests across the landscape. Uh, even though we have late successional reserves in patch form, riparian reserves were uh, expected to carry the ball for dispersal between uh, late successional patches, particularly in some areas where the late successional forests are in shortest supply. So this is very important functional um, consideration for riparian reserves and their management that uh, probably needs more attention um, beyond what I'll be able to give in this talk. Just an illustration very quickly of uh, how much riparian reserves were proposed to be shrunk under the Bureau of Land Management Western Oregon Plan revisions of the Whopper. Basically something like cutting them in half from the Northwest Forest Plan or less. Um, and in this case, um, for uh, these fish bearing streams, we have a buffer that's neck down to, what is that, a hundred and some feet from uh, an initial uh, tree height based standard way out here above 250 feet. So much narrower buffers and then the outer three quarters or so of those buffers would be subject to a fairly generic uh, rule allowing harvest if the, stands, if, if the stands in that area are not mature or structurally complex. That was a fairly ill-defined set of criteria. But um, as a rule, harvest would be allowed unless those conditions applied to the particular spots. So um, even greater reductions um, in many headwater stream conditions. So here, just identifying some of the common rationales that are put forward in uh, plans and proposals, uh, projects for uh, harvest in thinning and uh, fields reduction kinds of harvest in repairing reserves. So under the, with the objective of density reduction, some of the intentions of harvest are to hasten or rejuvenate growth of selective, selected leaf trees, so identifying some trees as priority and favoring them in future succession, preparing forests for future presumably uh, drier or more stressful climates by, say, reducing stem densities, reducing uh, moisture competition around large trees, um, and, and then uh, we've seen some projects that propose to propagate favor uh, dry site species where they're being overtopped by uh, more mesic species, um, return the site to where it's resilient to future drier conditions. Under fuels management, the primary uh, rationales usually boil down to uh, some structural uh, manipulation of the fuels to remove ladder fuel effects. Um, and then uh, some proposals that propose to break up fuels continuity on a larger scale defined on a scale of say thousands of, uh, of feet. Uh, we've, this is some, sometimes there's a phenomenon that's been uh, uh, labeled wicking where riparian zones burn with high intensity because in theory because they, they have high fuel loads. Basically uh, it needs to be recognized that um, riparian thinning involves trade-offs and uh, uh, there are short-term impacts and medium-term impacts and the trade the trade-off is against longer-term uh, processes or outcomes um, and the trade-off basically involves a fairly a high level of risk associated with especially when mechanical equipment operations are involved which is economically necessary in many cases uh, fairly there's a fairly high risk as associated with that of known and recognized harm to soils that are near streams um, and to veg and changes in vegetation that are counterproductive to uh, sustaining uh, high quality stream conditions. So sedimentation, temperature impacts of reduced canopy. So near stream soil disturbance, depletion of, uh, and then there's an issue of uh, when thinning is involved or fuels reduction is taking trees, there is a depletion, inevitable depletion of near and medium term recruitment of woody debris, at least in the smaller, medium, and the small, large size classes. That's the stuff you're taking off the site or cutting down and preventing from falling in the stream in the future. And I'll show a few more specific examples of that. And then uh, thinning is known to be associated under some fire weather conditions. Thinning uh, can actually exacerbate fire intensity. Um, also, this is somewhat dependent on forest types. Uh, but there's a fairly complex literature that's all over the map on this which shows that in fact uh, sometimes fuels treatments or thinning treatments have contrary to intended results of reducing fire severity. Um, impacts of road networks to the extent roads are necessary to operate um, and then uh, risk of pathogen dispersal into repairing areas from operations on the ground is another one that needs more attention. So near stream erosion and sediment delivery is sometimes a function of, as I mentioned, mechanical equipment operation and ground disturbance. But even in the case here, for example, where hand, pile, hand piling is done with a fair amount of concern to 
uh, avoiding ground disturbance, you get the soil, long-term soil disturbance uh, associated with burn, burning of those piles, um, uh, often highly sterilized soils. And when uh, there's a very intensive thinning treatment or fuels reduction treatment, there's lots of ground that's covered by these burn piles. That ground, very slow to revegetate. It's vulnerable to surface erosion during storms. And uh, uh, where that's located near stream channels, there's a potential for a chronic erosion. It's important to recognize when you're talking about management and riparian zones, particularly thinning management, that and and to some extent fuel reduction, that the uh, conditions of that prevail in these stands and riparian areas are significantly different than the conditions that are uh, described in most current silvicultural models, models that show how that predict how forest responds to a thinning treatment, or to um, uh, even even uh, empirical studies of thinning effects are almost all done on upland sites. So there are many reasons why it, the results could be substantially different in riparian zones, including higher soil moistures, uh, extensive areas that are not water limited. So there's really not competition for moisture and nutrients in many of these stands. There may be light competition, but uh, the, the, the dynamics of the competition are dramatically different than in upland sites. Uh, cooler, moderated microclimates that prevail in riparian zones that affect the competitive relationships between plant species. Uh, greater density and diversity of tree and shrub species in the systems. Um, and this is true both pre-disturbance and post-disturbance. For example, after wildfire, the kinds of species that uh, recover quickly in riparian zones, uh, it's a much broader array of species. There's often a large hardwood component um, that dramatically separates these from upland sites. Um, high diversity and frequency of natural disturbance types uh, that prevail in riparian zones. And then moderated fire behavior under many conditions when, when and if wildfire uh, enters the stand. Some examples of disturbance processes that, uh, that we see with uh, high frequency in riparian zones blow down landslides, fluvial bank erosion initiated tree fall, and uh, herbivory from various species. So here's a little more comprehensive list of some of the natural disturbances. Uh, we're talking about floods, fluvial channel migration, so channel lateral migration, root throw, blowdown, slope erosion, landslide deposition. Uh, diseases are often more prevalent in uh, near stream areas or wetter areas in riparian zones. So the uh, large, long list of things that operate, of these are processes that operate under natural successional trajectories in riparian zone to, to result in fairly complex conditions, even in post-clear cut situations in many cases. This is an example, oops, that's an example uh, right here where we were in earlier this summer on an Umpqua National Forest and they had flagged this unit as having, likely having a uh, homogeneous uh, post-clear cut 20-year-old plantation, 25 to 30-year-old, that needed to be thinned. And we got to the site, and uh, it was a structurally complex mix of all kinds of things with lots of hardwoods, lots of free-to-grow pines pushing up through the system. And they agreed rather quickly that it didn't, didn't warrant thinning that they had initially tagged it for. So we're finding this quite frequently when we visit these sites. Uh, wildfire, uh, project, project, predicting the effects of wildfire one way or the other in riparian zones is difficult. They, they can burn with high severity, they can burn with low severity. Generally speaking, statistically, they, they tend to burn with lower severity than adjacent upland slopes, although there are enough exceptions that it's, it's uh, significant. A lot of times, though, like in, in the Biscuit Fire, a lot of the high, burn, high severity burn situations are associated not with the natural fire moving across the landscape, but with fire suppression activities like very large burnouts. That needs to be carefully considered in assessing and predicting fire effects. Uh, some work on this question of debris depletion, thank you, is uh, Doug Hyken has, it's, it's I'm, there are a number of studies now that have accumulated that have looked closely at the question of what happens with the development and propagation of woody debris, and this applies to upland sites, but it particularly applies to riparian sites in stands that are either subject to natural succession after logging or that are thinned um, at some point. And a lot of the uh, specific intention in, with many of these projects in Forest Service ground are, are to increase the recruitment of, quote, large woody debris. Well, the consequence that's being 
shown in many uh, explicit analyses of the treatments are that the, in the near term and the medium term, for up to 80 years, there's actually a net depletion of woody debris recruitment to streams or into the snag population or in, onto the ground for those species that need that microhabitat on the ground. There's a net depletion um, that is lasts at least seven to eight decades, possibly longer. There may be a compensatory effect with some uh, some of the trees that are selected for that remain on the site getting a little bit bigger 80 years out, but there's a near term and a cost, uh, which is this, this fairly significant depletion of debris recruitment. Uh, it's been shown in several uh, agency studies, uh, general tech report on that previous slide that Doug Hyken pulled together. Um, this is some more recent work by Michael Pollack at the National Marine Fishery Service, again, modeling stand trajectories. Um, uh, in, under thinned and unthinned conditions and showing uh, substantial depletion of uh, woody debris recruitment total in total. And this is particularly uh, important in headwater streams where even small debris can play a substantial role in, uh, in providing habitat. So to sum it up, um, there's, there does seem to be uh, the, as I said, the, the, the benefits of riparian thinning uh, in my view, and looking across the literature, they tend to be substantially uh, less established than the risks are of to, to conducting these activities in riparian areas. But if we're going to look at it as a balanced decision, uh, here's some factors to consider in weighing that decision. Uh, and there may be conditions under which riparian reserve thinning might be justified, and those would uh, consist of places where there's a minimum risk and uh, some identified specific benefit to the practice, not, not sort of a generically assumed benefit. So moderate and gentle side slopes, terrain that's appropriate for this kind of practice, uh, not uh, outside of inner gorge, slope breaks and erosion prone soils, outside of the 100 foot inner zone where there's a fairly high level of, uh, of, rec of interaction between the debris. This is where most of the debris that gets to streams originates. Um, near stream or permanent roads are not required, so this these, these criteria reduce the risk of adverse impact. And then on the right-hand side, there are specific benefits that are identified, and some of the ones that appear to be more legitimate include uh, preservation of hardwoods or dry site species or release of those, uh, maintaining them on the site, uh, uh, ladder fuel reductions in some cases where there's an intention to control fire, for example, in uh, the uh, urban fringe zone. Um, and then where thinning, is, uh, where thinning is necessary to remove off-site or exotic species that have been planted on the site or invaded. And uh, so we can further develop, we've further developed a set of policy recommendations for kind of screening thinning proposals and some criteria under that should be considered for thinning uh, projects that move forward. Um, field inventory and analysis should show uh, site-specific objectives and the need and a site-specific evaluation of the likely effect of the treatments. Um, canopy re reduction <coughs> should not uh, be implemented in a way that causes warming of streams or wetlands. Um, all large woody debris should be retained on the site. Um, treatment should be accomplished from existing roads so you don't have to build a new road, road system to get in there and do the work. Or, or um, I think there's even questions about sustaining an existing lousy road system in order to get in and do the work. Cumulative area of riparian reserves impacted should be limited within a, any given, uh, we'll suggest a six field sub watershed here. So this, is, this basically, again, reduces the risk of adverse impact by limiting the area treated in any given decade. And then there should be a firm commitment to monitoring and reporting the outcomes. So uh, we actually learn from the experiment, which basically these treatments are. That's what I had to give, thanks.